Good evening, gentlemen. Today we'll look at uh, offshore oil platforms and uh, their activities and the types of platforms. So if I can list uh, activities that are uh, conducted by offshore oil platforms, one can list like this. Let me write down. production as well as exploration. So, of course, the first text activity is the exploration uh, of oil. You will appreciate that after the uh, geolog geological surveys are conducted and one identifies an area where oil is available one goes for exploration drilling. Uh, exploration drilling means actually drilling for uh, finding out actually if there is enough oil and if the pressure is available for the oil to come out by itself. So basically this activity means that you have to move your platform from site to site uh, and you cannot be at a particular site for long period of time. So exploration drilling is primarily done by uh, moving platforms. They are not done by fixed platforms. When exploration drilling is done for uh, shorter depths, we use a platform known as Jacob rigs. Maybe you have heard of uh, Jacob rigs. So Jacob rigs are rigs which uh, are jacked up to stand at a particular site for a small period of time when the jacks are lifted and the uh, platform can be moved to another site to be established there for again exploration drilling. So you have these uh, self-elevating platforms that is commonly known as Jacob rigs. And of course, you have the other types of platforms that do the same jobs such as semi-submersibles and drill ships. These are primarily moving platforms with their own power, except Jacob rigs, which are towed to different sites. But semi-submersibles and drill ships used for exploration purposes normally have their own power. After a site is identified by exploration drilling, um, something is done that is called well testing. That you test whether a well can be uh, can be uh, used for regular production. Is there enough oil? If enough oil is not there, what is to be done? And if at all, it can be used for production or not? This uh, well testing is normally done for short duration. And therefore, uses drill platforms, same platforms that are used for drilling are normally used for well testing prior to production. And in this, no storage facility is required. The oil that you bring out by testing the well is not stored or transported to uh, shore. It's actually burnt. Oil is burnt off. So you can imagine since this well testing technique is just a pre uh, prior to production technique to find out whether you can have enough oil or not, we use the same platform that is mobile platforms for doing well testing. These platforms are also required to move from well to well. And you know that in a particular site, there may be a number of wells. We may like to tap oil, not from a single well, but from a number of wells. There are platforms which can uh, tap oil from a single well, and there are platforms which can tap oil from a number of wells. So each well is tested whether that particular well can be 
uh, used for uh, production of oil or not. Then you have uh, something called uh, pre-production drilling. In uh, pre-production drilling is same as production drilling except that we have a time period where you want to uh, start production immediately for cash flow purposes. That means the full force of production would come a little later, but you start with one or two drill holes and slowly add up other drill holes for getting the full production. This is necessary because uh, uh, as you know, these uh, production platforms are high, uh, highly expensive uh, uh, installations and one cannot delay um, going to the full potential. So pre-production is primarily starting off with uh, limited number of productions through limited holes till you can establish your entire production facility that you can collect, connect all the drill holes and you can have the support facilities all geared together. So that is called pre-production drilling and then you have uh, production. I will not uh, spend much time on it. I will just mention what are the activities during production process. One of course is receiving oil from drill, drill holes. Okay. How do we receive oil from drill holes? You have to have a connection from the drill hole to the uh, surface or to a uh, system by which oil can be exported to shore. So this is primarily done through a pipe system which is called a riser system. We will see risers separately. Then after the oil is received, removal of water and gas from oil. Because when the oil comes up, it is mixed with large amount of water, groundwater and also a lot of gas. Now this is something which is uh, very interesting. In an oil production platform, even though there is a lot of gas, it is very expensive to control and uh, manage the gas. So the common practice is flare off the gas. Uh, this results in two things. One thing uh, is that uh, flaring gas at sea is uh, environmental pollution. So many areas in the world where there is oil find particularly near the shore, uh, burn off of gas is not permitted. And second thing is anyway a loss. You are getting something from the uh, earth and you are burning it off, so it is a loss. So there is, uh, there are some systems, some production facilities where gas is captured and also transported to shore. But if gas amount is low, this is an uneconomical process. Therefore, there must be sufficient uh, gas find to support oil and gas production at the same time. Then inject water and gas to maintain pressure. As you take out oil, the pressure on the oil field that would have automatically lifted the oil through the drill pipe uh, to the surface would reduce. Therefore, your flow will reduce. So it is necessary to maintain that pressure. That pressure is maintained as the oil gets consumed, pressure is maintained by injecting water and oil again to the drill, uh, to the field. So that oil pressure is maintained. This is what? Huh? 
separate separate you have to have separate drill holes through which you'll inject oil and gas uh, sorry water and gas uh, through riser pipes again from top you have to inject this to maintain pressure and this is this becomes important when the field starts getting consumed that is uh, either you have consumed uh, large amount and it has become a field with low uh, reserve now or initially itself the pressure was low, low but the oil field area being large it is worthwhile to uh, exploit it. So last item of course I have mentioned this. Air or process associated gas. Okay, once the production part is over, we have to look at storage, the oil that comes out from the earth. We have to store and export. It's called export. We export the oil to land. So, you have many uh, systems for this. Let me show you a diagram. I hope you can read this. Can you see? Okay, let us look at the first one. These rectangles I have drawn here, these rectangles, they are the platforms. I have shown here all floating platforms, but they need not be floating. This first one is a production without any storage or uh, storage or transfer at sea. The production produced oil straight away goes to the subsea pipeline to wherever it is being processed to the land. So, here the subsea pipeline becomes an important component of the uh, production system itself. Second method is where the oil is transferred to a shuttle tanker. Now, in this process there is no storage provided at sea. So, you can imagine that when one tanker is filled, the other tanker must be available, must be available otherwise there will be a lot of wastage of oil at sea. So, this shuttle tanker process is possible only when, when you have a very well managed shuttle service between shore and the production facility. Um, basically, this reduces your uh, infrastructural cost at sea, but at the same time providing uh, a continuous supply of shuttle tankers is also a difficult job. Third process where you have production, floating storage and offloading. It is called FSU, floating storage and offloading. Uh, that is the production platform stores the oil in a different ship, a ship like structure let me not call it a ship, a ship like structure which is used primarily for storage and then at sea this is offloaded to shuttle tankers. So, here the advantage is that your shuttle tankers need not be uh, so well managed as in the previous case that is there is a waiting time for the shuttle tanker which can be used. So, the production platform does not house any storage nor offloading uh, mechanism that is offloading is done by the ship. The fourth process offloading is done by the ship. Yeah, this 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 line I have shown by dark line that is the offloading line which is from the ship to the shuttle. This is the shuttle tanker. Can you see that? That is from the FSU to the yeah, tanker. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, the tanker I could not show. The paper has finished here. 
So, I just shown a little bit, okay. And the, I mean, the SSO must be having the equipment to pump the oil from. Yeah, 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 so the, that, that's right. So, that's what I am saying, the production platform does not have the equipment for transfer, offloading. Offloading facility is provided in this FSU. So, you can see this FSU need not have any uh, mechanism for moving itself. It can be a dump unit. We will see this uh, in a little more detail, uh, if this uh, floating systems, what they should have later on. Then you have the fourth type where you have some storage available in the production facility and then this is offloaded to shuttles through a standalone system which is only for offloading, no storage here. You see here it was a storage and offloading together, FSU. Here on the other hand the storage will be provided in the platform itself. This is what is called as SPAR. We will see this a little later how it is. So, this SPAR has some amount of storage facility inside this. So, the oil is stored here and then it is passed onto a shuttle tanker through a standalone offloading system. So, this rectangle shown here, sorry? So, what is that called? No, no, no. It says, it says, it is like a boy. It is a big boy with uh, which has the uh, offloading oh, facility, uh, equipment is there. Yeah, it is like a bunkering station, <laughs> yes. Are you, are you talking about single point mooring systems? These ships most likely they would be moored during offloading to an experience. Okay. Then last and the one that has taken uh, a lot of interest in recent days is the FPSOs, the productions which are integral with storage and offloading. So, all this uh, production, storage and offloading is put into one unit and as you can see it is a multi-point drill. Uh, connection to the rise uh, which comes to the riser to the ship and the storage facility is inside the ship itself. So, this is a big unit having its storage facility and also having its uh, offloading system. So, the shuttle can come here, the tanker transporting tanker can come here, can be offloaded and go. Now, you see in uh, a few years earlier whenever this production systems were designed, they were designed for lasting for a long period of time, the entire period that is 20 to 30 years. Normally, that is the lifespan of a production platform. So, they were taken to the site, installed and then they spent their life there and then they came back uh, or uh, went to the scrap yard. So, they were essentially dump units, but today there is a little change in attitude that uh, such facilities with 20 to 30 years of lifespan have reduced. There are a number of facilities which have less uh, storage capacity and we want to exploit them. So, a platform may stay there only for a few years and need not stay for the entire life. That means, during its lifetime it may go to 2-3 uh, sites for production. So, if that is so, some of the platform there is an argument that they should also be provided with mobility. So, of course, as you know mobility can come in many ways, it can have its own mobility or it can be towed. Of course, towing a very… Yeah, therefore, if you are converting an existing uh, tanker into an FPSO, then you have a distinct advantage that it has some mobility. On the other hand, one may feel if the tanker has spent already 10-15 years of his life in transporting oil, then you are only making a platform for 10 years or so. So, then the production facility is uh, the, the cost of the tanker including the machinery is a little excessive than if you build something without the tanker. But uh, all these points have to be considered in total while 
trying to find out production facilities for a site, keeping in view the uh, lifespan of the well also. Yeah, of course, the all this, the storage capacity, the environmental conditions, the vessels options that you have, and uh, reliability of the uh, system, all these will come into play. Then we have something called uh, work over. So there are two types of work over, one is light work over and one is heavy work over. What is work over? Unlike a ship, you have no mechanism to bring back the platform to shore for maintenance. Maybe you could do something with the platform, but what do you do with the drill holes and the equipment you have fitted to the drill holes uh, during its period of operation. So work over is a system of maintenance, particularly of the drill holes. So when you have a light work over, you can use a mobile platform with a riser to do the job. But when you come for heavy work over, it is necessary that maybe the entire drill pipe which has gone down the soil, that has to be cleaned, serviced and all these things. So you require a specific riser system which will be fixed. You cannot have a flexible riser. We will see what type of rider, risers we have. But uh, this is a longer period of maintenance, the heavy work over and the light work over is for shorter period. So you can see my point of showing this to you is that you can see offshore oil production and uh, storage and uh, transfer is such a very complicated uh, procedure. And of course, in all this, you have the, uh, in your background, the business angle and the uh, safety and pollution angles. Continuously they, they are there. Okay. Is this visible? No? Okay. So we will go for, look. let us look at riser systems. What sort of riser systems do we have? You can have basically three types. You can have rigid steel pipes, that is the pipes are designed thinking that they are rigid. You know, whenever you have a long length of pipe, it behaves like a string. But basically these metal pipes are considered to be rigid. Uh, you have, uh, if you have a floating platform here like this, the riser will come straight down like this to the drill hole. Is this is the drill pipe. You understand? So this is called a fixed uh, rigid steel pipe. On the other hand, we can have flexible risers. It can be either steel polymer composites. You know what is composite? Do you know what is composite? Composite means basically when you put, when you uh, weave two materials together to a continuous, uh, to give a continuous and engineer strength characteristics. You see, when you talk of a single material like steel, it has a, it's a isotropic material. This might have been told to you in your structures class. Isotropic material means its properties are same in all directions. Still, whether you are talking of longitudinal direction, transverse direction or depth phase direction, the ultimate strength or tensile strength is same in all directions. When we talk of composites, we actually mix two materials. So it is possible for us to mix it in such a manner that the uh, strength characteristics in all directions, we can 
predetermine and lay the material in that form. So, typical composite items that we see in, uh, in uh, common day use is uh, FRP, fiber reinforced plastic. So, you have glass fibers which are reinforced in a plastic matrix. So, by controlling the uh, fiber layout system, the longitudinal and transverse uh, fiber layouts, we can control the strength in both directions. Similarly, here steel and polymer composites are made, polymer is resin and steel uh, fibers are laid in uh, polymers and uh, steel composites, uh, composite uh, pipes are made which are uh, then you have also steel or titanium metal pipes. So, you have composite pipes or metal pipes which, which will behave like a flexible pipe. Okay. Fine. Right. What are the risers used for? Now, we can write down the use of these risers. There are mainly three uses. One is uh, oil import, that is transfer of oil from the drill hole to the ship. Then we require risers for water, gas injection for maintaining pressure. And lastly, yeah, these are the two main things, there is nothing more, water injection or gas injection. Actually, there will be two pipes, you cannot inject water and gas to the same pipe. So, one riser will be for water and one riser will be for gas, if both are required to be injected. How does a diagram of a pipe a riser system look? I have very schematically shown here, can you see this, is it visible? These are the fixed, uh, fixed risers which come down vertically from the platform and these will have to be supported by heave compensation devices. That is whenever the platform moves up and down due to heave motion or pitching motion of in any direction actually platforms are uh, normally squarish. That means length and breadth directions are nearly same. So, pitch and roll are of nearly of the same magnitude or uh, comparable magnitude. So, since it is a fixed uh, pipe and if the platform goes up and down, if it is absolutely fixed, it would pull the pipe along with it. So, to avoid that, you have what is called a heave compensation device in each platform, uh, which allows certain amount of vertical motion of the ship without hampering the uh, fixed pipe system. The other alternative is, is the flexible pipe I have shown here. The pipes are flexible, longer in length and they are connected at the bottom to the drill holes to a bottom laid pipeline. You can have this, you can have the drill holes at different places and you can take the pipeline to different places. Can you understand that? What we have done here? You see these risers are not all oil import risers. These risers one or two could be oil import risers and the other could be gas and uh, oil inje water injection risers, same here. So, I have shown here four pipes, four flexible pipes also I have seen uh, shown. So, if you did not have the fixed risers, then there, there would have been as per this diagram, there would have been four pipelines laid on the ground and from there you would have had the flexible risers. What I want to say is this bottom laid pipeline is not a must. You could have drill holes at various locations and you could take this flexible pipe directly through the drill holes 
which would then be spread all across the sea depth. Okay. Now, fixed risers are necessary for drilling, sometimes for production and mainly for work over. Whereas, flexible pipes are not used generally for work over purposes or for drilling purposes. The other interesting thing in um, platforms is its moving. How is it held in position? How is it held in position? Yes, anchors, but these are deep water anchors, unlike shallow water, uh, shallow water anchoring used in ships. A deep water anchoring, not only that, these are, uh, there are multiple anchoring systems in the catenary form. So, you have cat catenary anchoring normally of the order of 8 anchors per platform. Uh, that is one way. Uh, how will you hold a platform in position? You see, whatever way you have a platform or a riser or uh, mooring systems, it is necessary that the mobility of the platform in the horizontal plane or in the vertical plane has to be limited. Heave compensation device is one which compensates for heave motion of the sh ship with regard to the pipe. But what about the other motions? How do we control it? How do we control the motion of a platform in the horizontal plane? Um, can you tell me? Can you suggest Some something? Some flexibility has to be provided. Some, Some flexibility, of course. They make a bed, bed and there it is fixed. Okay. We will look at this after we see the types of platforms we have. Let us see. Let us, uh, I would like to take 5 minutes in telling you about design considerations that go into designing a particular production facility. The reason I will tell you is that this will lead, lead us to what sort of platform we should use for particular applications. Let us see. First, of course, is environment and loading that will be on the platform, right? Structural loading. Why is it so important? We do not talk about loading on a ship in a seaway. Unlike a ship, a platform will stand at one place continuously, long period of time. Heavy weather or light weather makes no difference. The platform has to be there. So, therefore, the loading on the platform must be considered at the design stage itself so that uh, there will be conditions of normal loading. You know about the various sea spectra for defining the sea conditions in seas, in uh, different seas. Are you aware? Okay. I believe this will be taught to you in another subject. The suffices to say that uh, let us take Atlantic compared with Pacific. It is fairly well known that Atlantic is rougher than the Pacific Ocean. And if you go to North Atlantic, then it is still rougher. So, there are the sea definition of the sea with regard to this roughness have been done by various people. And that is normally by saying waves of particular amplitude and frequency, how many of those will occur in a probabilistic manner, starting from the total energy content of a wave system. Do you understand? If when you say a sea is rougher than another sea, it means that the, that sea has more energy content in it 
than the other C. You understand? That is, waves are actually carriers of energy. Yes. So, when you say a C is rough, that means it has more waves or higher waves, therefore more energy. So, normally the C is defined in terms of an energy spectrum. The energy content of the C in terms of the various components of waves of various frequencies. So, that is an average spectrum. Since the all, almost all the C's have now been measured over long periods of time, we have spectra of various C's like uh, Derbyshire spectrum or uh, ITTC spectrum or North Atlantic, winter North Atlantic spectrum or John, John Swap spectrum, etc. There are various spectra devised by various people based on different sets of data. And you can define your C condition by a particular spectrum, but that gives you the wave wave condition of that C um, in a normal sense. That is, normally this is the C you will expect. That does not give you the uh, extreme condition. So, you have to ex estimate the extreme condition from there to calculate the loading and extreme condition at, uh, for an offshore structure is normally taken as once occurring in 100 years. Okay, so, that is pretty tough. You can imagine once occurring in 100 years, extreme condition will be a very heavy loading. So, you have to understand the environment in which you want to put up the platform and also the loading. Of course, environment also includes the depth of to which you will, uh, the depth of the sea and of course, it also means how much of oil reserve you have, whether it is a uh, good reserve or a marginal reserve or whatever. So, this is necessary to find out for doing a design analysis. Then whatever platform you design, stability forms a major uh, component of the design activity. Why is stability so important? Particularly in damaged condition. We do not have much problem in intact condition. Because it is a fairly big body and big bodies have large stability generally. Uh, but uh, in damaged condition when one leg is broken or a part of the hull is damaged, then what is the survival of the platform? keeping in mind the environment that you are encountering. Okay. Then the next important item is station keeping. How do you do station keeping? One of course, see mooring system. we have seen catenary mooring, so that it is held in position. Now, where do you attach these anchor ropes on the ship? Sending out eight ropes, catenary mooring or even a single point, single catenary if you have, it will have to go out from the ship to the bottom, right. How will the ship behave in case of waves, it will generally the so called horse around. That is, if a ship is uh, if I have anchor in the forward end to the seabed like this, then it will go around all over the place, right. So, what we do? We put two anchors. So, it does not go full around, but it goes somewhat a limited extent. Then we can put another anchor here, stern. This is the normal ship case where you allow the movement in a sort of uh, transverse direction to some extent and also in longitudinal direction to some extent. Now, for a production platform, all this is 
uh, difficult to manage. So what do you do? What is our intention? Our intention is that the drill pipe should not move. If I can hold my drill pipe by some means and allow the ship to move, then my purpose is served. Okay. So presently, we have a system which is used in FPSOs. You have a huge big uh, bearing in which the drill pipe is installed and the outer uh, seal is in the FPSO and the inner one is attached to the bearing, uh, to the pipe. So this is normally fitted somewhere in this area, in the front end, in a moon pool. Okay, so the entire ship can make a 360 degree turn, but the drill pipe remains unaffected. So this is the most recent mooring system that is being implemented in FPSOs. Previously, we used the normal system where you allowed some amount of freedom, but not much. The other thing, should we not be looking at design itself, how the movement of the vessel in 6 degrees can be restricted? Should we not be looking at that? What is the design feature of a floating system which will allow it to be stable as well as not do much of a movement? Will a ship like structure have less movement? The answer is no. Ships, particularly when waves can be from any direction, ships can drift to a large extent in the uh, breadthwise direction or lengthwise direction and also the heave and pitch substantial role also. The main variables that affect a ship's motion are water plane area to displacement relationship. Okay. Displacement we all understand. That is if my structure is heavy then of course its movement in the vertical direction the pitch, heave and roll would be less and these structures are heavy. So that is one advantage we have. What about water plane area? A body having large water plane area, will it move more or less in the vertical plane? Uh, typically heave, pitch and roll. What do you say? For that matter, even the horizontal plane that is sway, yaw and uh, uh, such. How, what is the effect of water plane area? If we have large water plane area, all these motions are likely to be more like a normal ship. If we have small water plane area, on the other hand, then these motions are drastically reduced. Right? Can we have some examples? In, in normal ship forms, what are the examples? We know of swath ships, small water plane area, twin hill ships. This was a design primarily to reduce water plane area of a ship so that it can behave better in a seaway. Same concept when you transfer to offshore platforms. What do you get? You can't have small water plane area, twin hull ships going from bottom to top. You do not require hulls piercing the water. You can avoid it altogether. How do you do it? We press, push the hull down. If you can have the underwater hulls where you can have our machinery and everything and can provide the required buoyancy for a top platform to exist. So you have a top platform, drilling platform, production platform. A huge platform, heavy, but that heavy platform can stay there only if it is supported by buoyancy. So we have a choice of having a ship which pierces the water like a normal long and thin body and provides the buoyancy the, by the portion that goes into water. Or we can have underwater hulls completely immersed in water which will provide the requisite buoyancy and this hull and platform may, can be connected by means of pillars. We can have that. So that gives rise to what is known as a semi-submersible, right? 
can you see one diagram we have a semi submersible here you have the underwater hull and a platform on top and you have these pillars the one that i have shown here is with six pillars you can see the plan there are six pillars and there are two underwater hulls you can have this with four pillars. So, if you look at the water plane, at the water plane level, you only have six circles, which is much less compared to the dimensions of the platform. Is that okay? Okay. Immediately by design itself, we reduce the motions to a large extent. A pitch, roll your surgeon's so way. Because all the wave loading that will have caused these motions is reduced because we do not have a plane to interact with the wave. We have just reduced the water plane drastically. Right. We have one problem if we reduce water plane. You know that stability. You remember stability is connected with uh, uh, the properties of the water plane. Do you remember that? Okay. I mean, there is a stability uh, subject which will become, in fact, in this subject from next class onwards, Dr. Sen will be taking that subject. So, you will be learning about stability. You realize that water plane is the main uh, feature which provides stability to the ship because it provides the transverse moment of inertia or the so called metacentric radius. What happens here? Since we remove the water plane, does the stability reduce? We have adequate stability in semi submersibles or not. There is we 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 take advantage of a physical fact that if I want a motion about one axis like this for these six pillars being the water planes, then the moment of inertia of this water plane about this axis of roll will be this area multiplied by this distance square. Okay. So, all it means is that if I can increase these distances, then I can increase the moment of inertia without adding much to the displacement. So, since these pillars are dispersed in space at long a large distance from each other, automatically I get large moment of inertia. Therefore, my stability I do not compromise with at all. In fact, I provide so much stability that I can have a large platform high above with my G going up. I can still be fully stable at sea. Stable to an extent that I can also damage my platform with one leg or uh, this thing or a part of the leg and I can still remain afloat and stable. Okay. So, what are the other design considerations? Motion response. So, we have seen, I have just talked about motion response. So, I will not go over this again, uh, except saying that to reduce the compliance to motion. I must have some uh, artifacts and such artifacts, see I cannot design anybody which will not have any motion. So, I can reduce it through design methods, but I must also have artifacts which will reduce, uh, which will control motion. So, what are the artifacts I normally use in a platform? If it is a long thin platform, my artifact will normally include 
bow thruster and stern thruster units. If it is a square system like a platform, uh, like a semi submersible, then I'm, I'll have a DP system, dynamic positioning system, where I have a number of thrusters to provide me motion control. And the other thing is heave compensation device we have already talked about. Then you have a most important design aspect of a platform is the structural integrity. Local loading, wave loading, we have mentioned about extreme loading, analysis of structure in extreme loading conditions, corrosion and maintenance, fatigue. Another important part that happens in offshore structures unlike ships is fatigue loading. What is fatigue loading? Fatigue loading is nothing but a cyclic loading. So when a body is subject to cyclic loading over a no, large number of cycles, it is subject to fatigue cracking. And uh, ships, run, ships go from wave condition to wave condition, same cycle does not occur uh, continuously. So ships have a longer fatigue life, whereas the offshore platform stands at the same place, therefore it experiences cyclic loading in a continuous manner. So fatigue becomes a very important aspect of offshore platform design. Therefore, you have reliability and risk analysis as a part of design code itself in offshore platforms. Today we try to bring that the experience from having a risk analysis code in offshore structures that we are trying to bring into ship design, whether a ship can also have a reliability based structural code, structural design code based on reliability. Okay, we will stop here, next hour we will see the various design pla uh, offshore platforms and also ships, thank you.